a study published in Pediatrics in February 2007, some 42% of youths reported to being exposed to pornography on the internet. 66% of those reported that that exposure was unwanted. This is a not surprising statistic. The internet as it currently exists is suffused with pornography. Go to Google Image, search on the word teens, and you'll find not teens in activities that teens would typically want to associate with, but teens associated with pornography. Of course, Google Images allows you to turn a safe search mode on, but when you turn it on, there's no reason, no lock that stops someone from turning it off. The internet is filled with this type of content, not filled in proportion to the other content that's there, but there's a lot of this content on the internet. And that's because there's a demand and the supply meets this demand. Now for some, this demand for pornography is perfectly legitimate. For others, it's not. The sum for which it is legitimate, sexually explicit speech, at least not sexually explicit speech, which is obscene, is constitutionally protected, where that sum means adults. But for others, it's not legitimate, meaning others who are kids. For those people, parents have the right to block access to this form of speech, and the law can help parents block access to the form of speech which the Supreme Court has called, quote, harmful to minors. Harmful to minors speech is regulable, at least with respect to the Constitution, at least with respect to children. The problem is it's not easily regulable with respect to the architecture of the Internet. Now, the question I want to address in this brief talk is whether it's possible to help parents block access to this speech, at least for their children, without unconstitutionally burdening access to this speech for adults. In my view, the answer to this question is that you can. And more interestingly, this particular problem is an example of a much more general point about regulation in the context of cyberspace. If, as many have argued, code in cyberspace is a kind of law, then we can imagine both good law and bad law, and we can imagine both good code and bad code. But the interesting dynamic that this problem reveals is how no law can create the incentives to produce bad code, and good law can help avoid bad code. First, some background. Now, this problem of giving parents the power to block pornography or harmful to minor speech from their kids is not a new one. The government has tried to help in this context, and so far it has failed. 1996, the Communications Decency Act was passed, which attempted to give parents some power in this context. It was struck down within one year by the Supreme Court. 1998, the Child Online Protection Act was passed, and it has been fighting a battle in the courts, striking parts and upholding parts, and still uh, wending its way through the federal courts to determine whether ultimately it will be a legitimate regulation of speech. But even this regulation, in my view, is too burdensome, and it's unfairly burdensome on access that adults legitimately have to this form of speech, and ultimately, in my view, it will be struck down. Now, in addition to the federal government trying to regulate the speech, the market has tried to regulate the speech, and the market, too, has failed, at least with respect to important free speech values. If you look at the range of technologies that are now sold in the uh, market to help block this form of speech, these technologies block much more than harmful to minor speech, and more troublingly, they block the speech secret. There's an invisible list here of effectively banned books on this internet, and that invisible list can't be reviewed by anyone to determine whether proper judgment was made to include some sites and not others. This concern about private blocking of speech led perhaps the most important free speech advocate in uh, the United States right now, the ACLU, to second guess the result of their first great victory in cyberspace, getting the Communications Decency Act struck down. They got that act struck down because the government regulation there was, as they asserted, unconstitutionally burdensome. But the response that they were fearful of was an explosion of a desire to substitute regulation by the government 
uh, with regulation by private technology, as they wrote in this famous piece posted just after their victory in the Communications Decency Act case. But today, all that we have achieved may now be lost, if not in the bright flames of censorship, then in the dense smoke of the many raiding and blocking schemes promoted by some of the very people who fought for freedom. Now, it's easy to understand why we have this explosion of private blocking and raiding systems. Parents won't wait for the government to figure out how best to filter uh, harmful to minor speech. They will get what they can to block harmful to minor speech, even if what they get is private and uh, blocks more speech than necessary. For them, it's better than nothing. And in this context, then, again, the point I want you to see is how no law or no effective law or no constitutional law can lead to very bad code. So how is a good law here possible? Well, if there's a solution to this problem, and again, I emphasize the word if, the solution comes neither from law nor technology alone. Instead, it will require uh, the cooperation of both. We're going to require law that will lead to the production of a certain kind of code that will lead to a market response that will enable parents to better protect their children. So how will this work? The problem here is that while computers are smart, they're not really smart enough to figure out the kind of filtering that's required in the context of harmful to minor speech. They're pretty good at generating prime numbers, for example, but they can't really distinguish between images like this from images like this. What we need here is instead simple labels, labels that effectively say, hey, this stuff would be deemed harmful to minors to give the possibility for technology simply to block it. Simple labels or a tag on content that would mark that content as the sort that is blockable because harmful to minors. Now that idea has led some in Congress to propose requirements. For example, Senate Bill 49 in the last con uh, Congress had a requirement of mandatory labels for content on the internet, labels that would make it easy to then filter and block content based on those labels. But the problem with this particular proposal is that it raised something like a scarlet letter problem, meaning that blocking would be affected by labels that were themselves visible or totally transparent to anybody getting access to that site, and that would quite rightly, in the minds of some, produce an unfair stigma associated with that content. Much content, which is not really XXX, would be associated with the idea of XXS unfairly to the, uh, from the perspective of those who are posting that content on the internet. Well, this particular problem has a relatively obvious solution. These labels required by the law need not actually be visible. Instead, the tag here would be a tag in the HTML or the code that builds the web page. That tag would only be visible by computers. Only computers would see it. Now, here's an example of how that might work. Imagine a tag um, H2M, meaning harmful to minors. That tag would go around certain content on a web page. Here's the HTML code for content on a particular web page. So that HTM uh, tag brackets certain content on that web page. A browser could then identify that tag and block it. Now that tag would only be seen if you view the source of the web page, not something that many of us do. It would be invisible to most, although computers would see it and be able to act on it to block content. Now, would that tag be enough? Well, alone, this tag would do no good, but it wouldn't be living alone. In instead, the tag here would be a first change, and that first change would then induce other changes too. So, for example, think about browsers as they exist on the internet just now. Already, browsers are building in something like parental control. So here's the Safari browser for the, window, for the Macintosh operating system. That enables people to click parental controls, which allows parents then to control what kind of access you get using the Safari browser. If we imagined uh, HTM as a tag existing on the internet, then we can imagine companies like Apple would add the ability to block content on the basis of whether it's bracketed by HTML. 
content. So we could imagine adding this preference option to the Safari browser to say block HTM content. And once that's selected, then that content would be invisible to anyone browsing the internet using the Safari browser. Well, then that leads some to ask, wouldn't the kids just change that option? And of course they would if they could, but that leads to the second change that's happening in the operating system market right now. As many people who use personal computers now recognize, these computers have operating systems that permit different accounts to be set up. Some of those accounts allow the person setting the account up to lock down control over the account so that only certain content can be accessed or only certain programs can be run or only certain preferences are permitted with certain programs. For example, preferences like the preference that says block H2M content. These accounts can be effectively kids-only accounts so that the only programs that run are the programs appropriate for the kids and the only programs that run would be programs that have their preferences set as appropriate for kids. So for example, again, the Safari program could be set to block all H2M content, and that preference would not be modifiable by any kid operating within that particular account. Now in this case, what we have then is a law that is requiring a certain change in the technology, which is responded to by the market by the market providing different technology to take advantage of this new filter. This would be a way of protecting kids without burdening adults because no adult would need to turn on the filter to block HTM content. Only kids would have that content blocked if in fact their parents wanted the content blocked. Well, what are the objections to this type of regulation? The first and most obvious objection is that it wouldn't affect foreign sites, and that's obviously true. But there's no reason why this particular technology wouldn't be able to be mapped with other existing technologies that make it possible to block sites on the basis of geography. For example, targeted IP mapping technology could be integrated here to block sites from foreign countries that aren't compliant with this requirement. Uh, but still allow access to sites that did certify that they were compliant with this requirement. Second question is, isn't it too hard to determine whether content is harmful to minors? And the answer to that is, again, yes, it's very hard. But the point is, it's just as hard as the requirement that exists in real space, a requirement that exists in practically every state in the United States in real space. But there's an advantage here to the block being imposed by law. If you disagree with something that Nanny blocks, what can you do about it? The answer is nothing. You could complain to the company that produces NetNanny, but if they disagree with your complaint, too bad, so sad. But if you disagree with a block that's imposed by the law, then that law, that block, uh, can be challenged in, uh, uh, in a court because any law, as it restricts speech, must be justifiable against, uh, against the standards of the First Amendment. So unlike private blocks, which uh, are imposed and difficult to discern, these public blocks, even though they're hard to figure out, would still uh, be challengeable and testable according to the standards of the First Amendment. Finally, isn't this law requiring tags that could be used to block content a form of censorship? And this is, in my view, the most important point to convey. In the context of cyberspace, we should not understand this as a form of censorship. Of course, it's government action, and it's government action that's enabling parents to control access to certain speech, and as a response of that government action and parental control, certain speech is blocked, namely speech that's harmful to minor to kids. But we should compare that type of block to the alternative that we have already seen the market develop. For if government doesn't act here, if there's inaction, then we know that there will be a spread of, quote, censorware, technology that blocks access to speech, but blocks much more than the access that should be blocked if what we were concerned about is simply harmful to minor speech. If you care about free speech, then we need to care about whether speech is free. And that we care about by looking much more broadly than the simple, narrow question whether law is 
regulating or blocking the speech. This is a classic example, in fact, I think the best example, of how inaction here produces bad code, and that bad code is in effect the uh, cause of what we should think of as the censorship that exists in the internet today. So what would the proposed bill here look like? It's quite simple. The requirement would just be that any website subject to the jurisdiction of the United States must tag harmful to minors material with this simple tag, H2M. Then the law should also have certain procedures to make it easy for people to uh, um, certify uh, whether their content is harmful to minors or to take advantage of a safe harbor if they follow those procedures to guarantee that they wouldn't be regulated by that law. This law would then create the incentives necessary for browser manufacturers to take advantage of this tag. That browser manufacturer would then make it simple for parents to block on the basis of that tag. And the only people who would be affected would be those who want to take advantage of the filter that this law now enables. That filter would filter content deemed harmful to minors by the poster of that content from kids while leaving to the rest of the world no burden imposed by this law at all. Now, I think the bigger lesson here is that we all have something to learn about how regulation in cyberspace will function. The liberals, of which I count myself as a faithful member, um, argue often that we do nothing in the context of these problems, that we leave the government out, that that's the best way to respect the traditions of civil rights. Um, but my view is that we can harm free speech here by doing nothing doing nothing in a world where we know the technology will change in response to doing nothing is often to affect a change that restricts in important ways important values of free speech mm -hmm.